The paper is called uh, What Learning Systems Do Intelligent Agents Need? Um, Complementary Learning Systems Theory Updated. The three authors, two of them are from DeepMind, uh, that's the first two authors there, and McClelland is from Stanford. He's uh, famous for being one of the authors of the PDP books in the 1980s, you know what that is. Um, so uh, he's been around for a while and sort of classic neural network type of stuff. That's what introduced deep learning to the world, that book. Was it, well, they didn't call it deep learning back then. No, they didn't call it deep yeah. learning. That name came a lot later. Yeah, I actually found those books frustrating. Um, they were super hot. Everyone was reading them. I had my copy. I went through them page by page. And, um, but I just felt like it didn't explain how brains worked at all. And it was like, oh, it's so frustrating. You know, everyone's excited about it. Anyway, this paper came out in 2016. And it, what it is, is essentially, uh, it's an update to a paper that McClellan and another person published in 1995. Um, and it's sort of getting back to it again because people had complained or there was new evidence that basically contradicted what he proposed back in 1995. So that's why it's uh, complementary learning systems theory updated because they're saying, hey, you know what? People said this isn't true, but here's the evidence and blah, blah, blah. So I'm now gonna to switch to my presentation. Um, hopefully you can see that. Yeah. And this is, a, uh, I guess I can just make it full size. Um, this is a, a basically a, uh, an explanation of what this paper is about, what this theory is about. And, um, and they're calling this complementary learning systems theory. It's a really old idea. It goes back way before 1995. It goes back to the early eighties. So I don't know why they came up with a name for it, but I guess it didn't have a name before. So this is a real sort of synopsis of what this idea is. So here's a very crude picture of a you know, neocortex, um, multiple regions projecting to each other, you know, some hierarchy. And then you have this enteronic cortex and hippocampus, which is sort of at the top of the hierarchy. And the idea is that there's two different types of learning going on here. Above the blue line in the entorhinal cortex and the hippocampus, you have a system which is very rapidly learning. They can learn on a single shot in a matter of seconds. And its basic idea is what it learns is episodic memories. And these are like you know episodes in your life that what you did, oh, I was here, what did you do this morning? Where is that story? Where you said, okay, remember how you got here this morning. Remember what you had for breakfast. Uh, uh, what you had for dinner or what, you know, what happened yesterday, that's going to be stored in the hippocampal complex. It's episodic, very specific experiences, and you want to keep those separate. The neocortex, according to the theory, is that it's more of a gradual learning system. It learns slowly, and um, it doesn't represent episodic memory. It represents more structured model, uh, models of the environment. This would be things like, when we talk about modeling of objects and things like that. Um, what are the, um, and then there's a third, that's what the two, complementary learning uh, pieces are. And a third part of this theory is that we learn uh, first, we always learn in the hippocampus complex. That's where we form initial memories. And then those are later transferred to the neocortex, okay? Um, and the, this idea came about mostly, first, I think, from, the, from this very famous person that most of you I'm sure have heard of, or at least most of you have heard of, uh, called H.M. We now know his name after he died, Henry Molson or something like that. And he had both of his hippocampus, hippocampi removed, and he couldn't form any new memories. And, um, and so what happened was he could remember everything in his life prior to about 30 days before his surgery. So, but af after that 30 days before his surgery, he could form no new memories. Well, at least it wasn't obvious he was forming any new memories. And um, this is very, very strong evidence that, I mean, he couldn't remember anything moment to moment, right? You know, you, you introduce yourself and turn away, you look back at you, you wouldn't remember he met you. Uh, so this is evidence that, um, that these memories were first formed in the hippocampus and then transferred later to the, uh, to the cortex and maybe takes over for several weeks to do that. That's where that idea came from. Um, and uh, now the problems with uh, this theory uh, that they talk about in this paper, uh, some challenges to it, is that the hippocampus does a lot more than just episodic memory. Um, and there's all kinds of memory in it, and some of those things seem to be more general knowledge. So it's not just purely episodic memory, and there's also evidence that the neocortex can learn rapidly. 
um, under certain conditions. Uh, if, and I, I, this is a quote from the paper, if the new information is consistent with previous learning, I, we'll talk about that in a second. So what they wrote about in this paper, basically saying, here's our theory we introduced back in 1995, at least McClellan did. I don't know why Passibus and the other author joined in on this one. And um, these are some of the things that are contrary to what the theory says. And they didn't really argue against this. They basically said, okay, we're gonna modify our theory so that the cortex can learn rapidly and the hippocampus can do other things too. So basically just accept these changes. But we don't think this is, we still think this is the right idea. Um, now you get, what's really interesting to me about this, it took me a long time to figure this out, but they're essentially arguing that the New York cortex learns by back propagation. And, and so to keep that idea in place, Back propagation cannot learn quickly and has to be, you have to do interleave learning of all your previous knowledge, or at least you have you know, uh, catastrophic forgetting. So they really want to keep that idea that still information is being learned in the hippocampus and the hippocampus plays back these memories repeatedly, very rapidly, um, uh, interleaving memories from the past and the present so that the cortex can learn to your back prop. Uh, I don't think that's true at all. And um, we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, so, uh, there's also, and I didn't find it, I didn't look for it, but I read a paper, um, sometime in the beginning of the Manto, so maybe 15 years ago or something, which made the argument that, um, memories are not being transferred from the hippocampus to the cortex, um, that there, it was a good argument. I don't remember what it was, but it was a solid argument. It really you need the hippocampus for the neocortex to solidify its memories, but they're not being transferred. That is, they're starting to form in the cortex already, but they won't finish forming unless you have this interaction with the hippocampus. And this always made a lot more sense to me um, because it just, the idea of transferring memories from the hippocampus all the way down through all these different layers of the cortex, it's never made any sense to me. It's like, you don't transfer memories in the brain like that. Um, you know, it's associated memory learning and so on. So anyway, so that's another challenge, which they didn't, they didn't talk about that paper in this paper. They didn't talk about this idea that, hey, there's a lot of evidence that the, cor that the, uh, the cortex does not transfer memories, but it's, um, but anyway, that's, that's what this is, paper's about. And that sort of summarized the entire paper, if you will. Um, uh, but why did it take me so long to read this paper is that it's filled with lots and lots of interesting citations and tidbits. And so I guess got kept going down rat holes, well, not rat holes, these are very productive holes. Um, I mean, paper after paper, you're going to say, oh, what about this? And I'll talk about some of those. Um, but from the paper itself, that, this is pretty much summarizing uh, what it's about. <laughs> so, um, um, and, and, be, and before I go on, I'll let people talk, we can just discuss it. I mean, I don't know why people just don't summarize their work in this way. <laughs> clear. <laughs> yeah, it, it wasn't very clear, this paper. Um, I have to admit that. It wasn't very clear. I mean, it was all, in some sense, properly written. I mean, you know, you can't put it in a single sentence and say, well, you could say the sentence is confusing, but uh, but it's one of those papers where you just have to just keep reading it and plug around, what are they talking about, and so on. I mean, it's not a terrible paper. It was this fine paper, but it, it did take a while to read, and it had lots of interesting tidbits, some of which really, really, were very important to this basic idea, and some were just very interesting. So, um, does everyone understand this? Well, well it's interesting in this context. In, in the year 99, I looked at, uh, analyzed intracranial EEG data. Yeah. There was a probe in the hippocampus, and then there was a probe in some cortex site. Yeah. And then the, the interesting thing was looking at the, the correlations between the two. And then, and, and the, the subjects, they, under, they actually underwent surgery to remove epileptic centers. And they had a, a, a memory retrieval task. They were asked, do they see these, these words? Do they yeah. recognize these words or do they recognize these faces? Yeah. And it, especially for the faces, there was a pretty clear signal that suggests there's some kind of recognition going on in the hippocampus yeah. of the face. It's yeah. sort of, it's, it sort of looked like the neural cortex asks, or do you recognize the space? And then the yeah. yes or no. Maybe. Yeah, exactly. um, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think from correlations, you can't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can just say the signals yeah. are correlated. But, but that's right. Right. Maybe right. a lot of different related to. Yeah, there was there's a figure in this paper which I what I could show you. I wasn't going to go through it, which is basically looking at fMRI data and talking about using that to determine sparsity. I'm like, you can't look at fMRI data to determine sparsity. 
Um, uh, so those kind of things are said. Uh, again, I want to get everyone online, give a chance to ask questions or. What was the evidence that uh, challenged the CLS theory? Oh, uh, lots of details. I, I mean, it basically fit into this thing like, oh, it seems like that uh, just like like uh, Heiko was saying, oh, like the hippocampus can learn other types of knowledge. There's not good episodic memory. There's goal related behaviors. There's you know, um, it wasn't spelled out really clearly. Like here's the five things that was going to just burst them out. I could dig it up again. Uh, none of it seemed particularly interesting to me, but but it was along these lines, and they showed that there are, the neocortex can learn rapidly under certain conditions. Like uh, so, they could you know they could. Um, you know, I, I have to go look again, but it'd be something along the lines of the rat ex, ex, learn something quickly, and then they, you know, they immobilize the, the hippocampus with some chemical or something like that, and can the rat still solve the problem? Now, yeah, the rat can still solve the problem, like a water maze problem. And so he can't be using his hippocampus because we just temporarily blocked it, but he still can solve the problem. So it must have learned it rapidly in the cortex because the hippocampus is not working. That kind of thing. Yeah, I think there's like if there's reward or a big reinforcement signal of some sort, like food or pain or something, you can learn very rapidly. Right. So I mean, that's didn't, clear. didn't HM also, he could also learn new things. He, he couldn't remember how he learned them, but he could actually learn new skills. He can learn time. motor skills, right. And um, he did. So, yeah, this, it's a complex. I think that took a long time, though. That wasn't like a. Yeah, idea. right, right, right. Um, I mean, first of all, I've always felt that this kind of idea is important for future of AI systems uh, that you have, because there is a need to have some part of your brain learn very, very rapidly. And in the brain, I it, it, we'll get into this. One of the set of papers I read was all about silent synapses and different types of synapses that must be operational in the court, in the hippocampus. And I've always said this. I said, look, if the hippocampus is going to learn really rapidly, it can't be doing it by synaptogenesis. It can't be growing new synapses because that takes hours to a day. So there has to be another mechanism. So I speculated many years ago that that mechanism is going to be existing synapses that are turned on and off rapidly. And now I have a whole bunch of papers on that, which I've read, which is really interesting. That's one of the raffles I went down. Um, the problem with that memory is you have to have a huge number of synapses that are this formed and occupying space and energy, but aren't doing it. So you can't do that throughout the entire brain. You'd only want to do that in some places where you really need to form rapid memory. So it turns out that the, the, the uh, neurons in the hippocampus have very, very high number of synapses of which many of them are silent, most of them are silent. So they, they would have a much higher metabolic cost, but they give you this ability to turn on synapses rapidly off. I have a paper here, I'll show you about that. It's kind of cool. Um, and, um, so you wouldn't want to do this everywhere. Now, in our theories that we've been working on here, the temporal memory and the temporal cooler and the, and the stuff that Vivian and, and Niels are doing, um, we don't have that metabolic restriction and we can form synapses as we want. So we could make, we could have a single memory system that at any point in time, we decide it's going to learn quickly or not learn quickly. Um, uh, it's, we don't have that biological constraint uh, that they have there. And indeed, we've always, that's how we, we tested our models. We just said, hey, we can learn quickly, not learn quickly. It's no problem. Um, but I do think that the idea that you're, that uh, uh, any system has to be able to say, okay, there's some base knowledge, which I'm going to rely upon. And then I'm going to learn new combinations of it rapidly, um, uh, which makes sense to do it after you sort of filtered it through your base knowledge. Like, okay, I'm in some environment, the things I recognize, what did I do this morning? I have to remember exactly what I did this morning. And I probably don't want to remember that forever. I don't want to remember what I had for breakfast every day for my life. That would be kind of really confusing and weird. Maybe a, maybe an AI system could do that. I don't know, but you know we don't do that. So the idea that you might have a, a, a sort of a, a, temp, a place where you, you more rapidly learn memories and then forget them, um, and and we'll get into a moment here how you form those memories could be a little different in 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 certain episodic type of situations. Um, so one one question I have is how do how does sort of grid cells, how do grid cells place cells that hold sensory motor and learning of the environment and stuff? How does that play into this? Well, it's interesting. In this paper, there wasn't a single mention, even though there's lots of stuff about entomotic cortex and hippocampus. I'll show you pictures of what they, they showed. Not a single mention of grid cells or placements, mm -hmm. as far as I could see, not one, nor of any sensory motor learning. 
Um, they basically consider the cortex as a deep learning network with backprop, and um, that was it. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so, I mean, I can talk about how we think it plays into this. No, right, but they didn't talk about they it. They didn't talk about okay. it, not at all. I was, I was really shocked by that because this is a, not that old a paper, and, um, and you've got, you got two guys from deep minds there, and so you think they would at least give some kind of like passing mention of this, um, but nothing really. That was really, that struck me after a while. I said, wait a second. <laughs> uh, also, you'll see in a moment, you'll see their models of neurons are very, very simple. Uh, the point neurons, that kind of stuff. You also have this idea that there's um, kind of short-term memory of our current scene and environment yeah. that's structured in some way. Is that it's not quite the same as episodic memory? It is, I think. It is. I would say it is actually. Okay. It's like you're just you're just taking a bunch of your current experiences, and if you can recall it, even a few seconds later, you have the form of memory of it. Right. Right. And so, uh, but is that what they mean here? I thought that by episodic memory they actually mean like long term remembering of specific events. Well, it is long term. As opposed but, to kind of like a, what, a, a, a distinction. I, to me, one of the things you can learn quickly here and you can forget quickly here. Okay. Right? This is my, my interpretation. Um, and I, I guess, you know, I guess one of the problems with the word episodic memory, because it, it does imply what you just said. And, uh, they do use that term. Um, they also talked about a specific experiences. So then it wouldn't be, maybe that would be something a little different. Okay. I, I think, but, you know, imagine this way, you know, I could remember what I had for breakfast this morning if it was really important to me. Uh, or, you know, Karan had some oysters and got sick at the, uh, at Nips and the Rips, right? <laughs> He's kind of- So then you remember. You know, <laughs> for a long time, it's like, you know, um, What did you have the day before for breakfast? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's I, I mean, I mean it's so, I mean, it's just, you can form rapid memories and they want it to be specific. I guess with the, when I was using the word episodic here, maybe I'm not sure exactly how they used it. When I use the word episodic, it meant that you're not trying to generalize, you're trying to remember a specific set of circumstances. Right. Like, it's not like, oh, here's the range of chairs in the room. It's like, here was the range of chairs in the room when I came in and there was a dead body in my apartment, right? That would be a, you know, that's a very specific arrangement because it was important to remember, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone, anyone online want to ask questions before? Yeah, going? So I was wondering, do, 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 uh, sorry, um, is, is there, I mean, it seems to me that there's potentially two different mechanisms at play. It's like for, for like short term memory, it's almost like you've got this echo chamber, like where you do the, the things you've seen recently. Um, there's like this for, for things that were close by in time, you have a very fine recollection of it, but the further away they get in time, the more coarse that, that sort of recollection gets. You remember specific snippets of things, but not like whole sequences. Um, but at some point, um, if those were salient enough, uh, they, they found purchase in, in, the, in the cortex somewhere because they, they had, yeah, again, right, were, were, right, right, that's uh, right, right, reason to be stored. Um, but but those are the, the ones that had salience are probably the ones you keep thinking about over and over and over again. Right. Is what gives it a chance to 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 right. uh, be stored. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll show in a moment one of the mechanisms why we would forget things. Um, uh, but I, I, I don't know if you're coming up with a question, but I agree yeah, no, the, question, the, the question is, is like, um, is there any mention about that, that short term memory, that, that, that part of the, of the memory system that basically is, is replaying recent events, again, with less and less frequency, I guess, the, the further away they get in time, but, but the ability for us to recall like the last, you know, two sentences that you said, uh, but then forget the thing you said five minutes ago, um, you know, they didn't go into that to find detail, although I was thinking about those issues the whole time I was reading the paper. And I, I, I there's a figure later, uh, I'll show you what, which will play into that a bit. Okay. Um, yeah, I was just wondering, maybe you'll get to this, but yeah, it would be interesting to discuss a bit more kind of, yeah, your concerns around the kind of memory transfer concept from hippocampus to neocortex and like... Um, Okay, well, I always felt like um, um, the, the idea that you're transferring it is, is it's a little weird, right? There is this replay, which I talk about a lot, which I'll talk about, but how do you replay that back through the entire hierarchy, right? Um, the entomotic cortex doesn't project to all regions in the cortex. It projects to these very high-level regions. So 
you know, where does the transfer stop, right? They kind of say, oh, it crosses this blue line. There's the red arrow. Now it's now it's all backprop all the way down. I never believed in backprop in the cortex. I know the cortex can learn quickly. Um, that's not how the cortex lurks, you know, it's sensory motor learning. So how is it that you can transfer knowledge, I just sensory motor knowledge in some sense from, from some memory in the cortex, in the antiviral cortex, um, it just never, it never makes sense. It's just like neurons didn't seem to have the capacity for that. And then that was a hand wavy argument, Neil, but I felt it pretty deeply. And then I, then I read these papers that said, yeah, it doesn't work that way. And so I just filed that away like, yeah, that's the wrong idea. If I remember correctly, it was more like, it's not so much that there's a transfer. It's more like they're learning in parallel. Right, right. right. And the hippocampus right. sort of maybe firms things up or maybe yeah. it fixes it a little bit, but it's not like actually copying memories from one so side there, to another. There is right, a, and it, it's not like, yeah, there's absolutely nothing going on in the neocortex unless the hippocampus is sending something. Right, right, right. exactly. Right, right. Exactly. And, and, and of course, there is, they talk a lot about this. I wasn't going into detail about it, but there are these um, these things called sharp wave ripple things mm -hmm. that are going on in the, in the hippocampal complex. And so it is known that when an animal um, either stops moving and rests or when it's sleeping, that there are times where the cells will replay recent experiences uh, rapidly, like 10 times faster. And they do this like all in a little, little snippets of sequences, very small little snippets of sequences that occur within a single um, uh, oscillatory wave. Uh, cycle. They wave yeah. Right. And, and so now, so that's really interesting that this happens. Like if a rat just move through the maze, it'll just re recall in reverse order the, the path that it just took. Now, it doesn't quite fit what they're arguing here, because what they're arguing here is the cortex is a, a, a deep DNN with backdrop, then you have to basically train on everything all the time. You can't just replay the last, you know, inter interleave the last, you know, days worth of experiences. If you want to uh, avoid catastrophic beginning, you have to train on the entire corpus of all knowledge, which they never address. Um, and it's not clear what those uh, sh those replays in the sh uh, in the sh sharp waves are doing, and and um, it's not clear if they're not happening in the cortex too. So that's a mystery which they use as evidence uh, for this idea. Um, but I think it's not well thought through, and there's contrary evidence too. So um, and it doesn't really fit the bill. If it, if it's really a back prop system, then you have to replay all of your training episodes, interleave them all. As we know, it doesn't work if you don't do that. Um, and, and there's no evidence that this is actually happening. Could, couldn't it be that there's two things going on here? I mean, because there are fiber bundles that are connecting parts of the cortex that are not going through the hippocampus. Um, so you could be getting like, you know, the as the sensory data and the motor data are being processed, they're communicating back and forth to the prefrontal cortex and the parietal lobe and all these other places. Um, that's just like storing like pattern recognition and recall and things like that. You know, like you're trying to fetch specific data from that's been stored elsewhere and sort of resonate back and forth with it. But then the hippocampus and the interrotal cortex give you a sequential ordering to that. And so those fast ripple responses, that's sort of what I was saying earlier about the, the, the local echoes. It's like you're replaying the sequence of events real quickly and sort of solidifying that there's a sequential ordering to these memories that you've been storing. Maybe, maybe. I think it's hard. It's really, um, it's speculative. Uh, I think, you know, we have a nice understanding how models can be learned without this. And, um, um, and so, you know, we could speculate on all these things, but I think we have to fit them into the thousand brains theory model. We have to say, well, what is that I need? And, and, you know, at this point in time, I don't think we know enough to say, why would these sharp wave ripple effects occur? Uh, what are they doing? They clearly don't recall everything. They only recall little snippets. They um, it's just, I, I think we, it's no point in speculating deeply about what their purpose is. There's a lot of things that happen in the brain. We don't understand it, but it, if it, if it, it fills a theoretical need and we can dig into it, um, the moment we don't have a theoretical need for that. Um, and you know, we don't want to, as always, I don't want to dig into biological details, which may only rel be relevant for biology. If we don't have a theoretical basis for why we need them from an information processing point of view. So I'm just going to leave it at that. Um, there's a lot of weirdness about these sharp wave things. Um, they don't replay all memories. They they go forward and backward. It's weird. Um, and it's just and they only more recent things. So who knows? Um, I, I just don't want to spend a lot of time on that. 
Um, I like to keep going if I can. Yeah. All right, this this is the first figure in this paper. It's basically their figure doing the same thing I just talked about. This is their figure representing the um, representing this idea, and they're they're showing the green hours are showing parts of the cortex talking to each other, and they argue in the upper left box that those were a gradual acquisition of structured knowledge. And then the red arrows are in the hippocampus, which are you know, uh, fast learning of arbitrary new information. And then the blue arrows are these biconnectional links between cortex and hippocampus for uh, you know, learning and reply and so on. It was not very useful drawing. I will point out there was one thing right away, they start, they start giving you this clue here that where they use the word um, acquisition of structured knowledge through interleaved learning, which is really their their thing going back to like um, how you'd have to train uh, deep learning networks. So that's not a very, you know, that was, it took me a while to what else the slide about. Um, here's a, a figure two. This is the, their picture of what the neocortex is like. And they say a neocortex like artificial network. And, um, and so you can see my, my notes on here. Uh, they basically propose that the neocortex is like a multi-layer ANN with point neurons real value weights and activations in backprop. And you can see they, they on the upper right there, they say, oh, here's a target, the output of the circuit's a target, and then you're gonna feed that back as in backprop to, to train layer four, layer three, layer one. Um, this is really too simplistic at all. There's no attempt to explain why there's different layers, anything about time, sensory motor, you know, nothing. Um, and, uh, and, and the only thing I could think about is they basically were describing a multi-layer ANN why are they doing it? Is so they can argue that uh, it needs to be trained through interleaved learning from the hippocampus. That's what my conclusion at the end of that was. It, is, it also seems to me a little bit like it's just sort of kicking the can down the road in the sense that, okay, now you, you how does the hippocampus know how to train the neocortex right. to figure, <laughs> recognize things? Or it's just like making them the supervisor. And if you think about a deep learning network, yeah. it's like the supervisor. Piece. Right, right. But how does the supervisor learn? Right, it's right. Like, it's not right. And, and it's so simplistic. I mean, we yeah. know how complex these circuits are. And we now know there are grid cells in the cortex. I mean, all this stuff is not represented here at all. So it's not really, it's more of a say, okay, this is where some people's brain is still at in 2006. Um, it's pretty old school in my mind. It's still 2022. Yeah. This is an interesting figure. Um, and this is a this is a circuit diagram of the entorhinal cortex in the hippocampus. If you don't know, CA1 and CA3 are in the hippocampus proper. EAC is the entorhinal cortex. GG is, I believe, part of the hippocampus too. They're arguing that the red, the pink areas are fast learning and the blue areas are slow learning. These again are kind of mostly point neurons. Um, and they show the neocortex projects into the circuit and it projects out of it. So I don't, I mean, it, this is a very basic block diagram, but there were some interesting things that came up in this. So here's some things I didn't like about this diagram. Not so good. The text describing it wasn't very clear. The descriptions were vague. Uh, there was no mention of place cells, grid cells, and the antiviral cortex. And, you know, how can you be talking in the, in, within, you know, in the last 20 years about the function of these circuits about talking about grid cells and place cells? I don't know. Um, and the neurons are point neurons. Uh, you know, we know the system is much more complex than this. But they had all this interesting research cited around this figure. Um, and, and, and so this is not just speculation what was in the paper, but there's papers about this. That So I'll read some of these. The circuit creates a unique overlapping representation in CA3. So there's a lot of evidence to suggest what the whole thing is trying to do is form unique representations of events, uh, combinations of events in CA3, um, um, which is what you're going to need to have episodic memories. You want to remember one instance of the same set of objects or some place different than another. What did I have to do back to this morning from what I had yesterday morning? I, those have to be separate, yet they have to be made of the same element. Um, these are, there's a lot of parallels here to what we do with the temporal memory and the temporal pooler. With temporal memory, is we're taking a series of elements that are common, you've seen them elsewhere, and we're forming a unique representation for them. And the temporal pooler is saying we take a set of elements, we're forming a unique representation for them. So when I was reading through these papers, like, oh yeah, it's a lot of what we do already. Um, there's a couple of interesting tidbits here. The I never really studied the dentate gyrus, which is that DG thing, the dentate gyrus. Yeah, I know it's there, but there's some interesting papers about this. So it looks like the each cell in the antiviral cortex, I'm not even sure which cells these are, because the antiviral cortex has many different types of cells, but there's a bunch of cells that project to the DG and they form 15, it seems to be random synapses, like they're not learned. 
And so what you end up with, the dentate dent gyrus has a, a lot of neurons there and it's extremely sparse. And it's just a sparsifier. It takes whatever pattern you have in the dentorhinal cortex and just creates a very unique, very sparse pattern for that by, by forcing it to be sparse. It's a little bit like our temporal pool, but just forcing it to be sparse. Um, and then that becomes a, a way of a context for CA3 to force CA3 to say, I have a set of elements here, but I'm going to make sure I have a, a unique uh, um, uh, representation for the set of elements. So CA3 is less sparse. Um, one of the things about, um, so the dentate drives, it's like a randomizer. Um, and one of the things that's known about the dentate gyrus, it was the first place in the brain where they found evidence of, uh, of neurogenesis and that there's constantly new cells being formed there. Uh, that it's not the only place. We now know that that's occurs throughout different parts of the cortex and other places. So, but this is the first place I saw it. It happens rapidly. So the theory is um, that this randomizer, you never want it to repeat itself. You just basically, so you're constantly forming new neurons and throwing away old neurons, and you're randomly connecting the new neurons um, to the output of the, the entorhinal cortex with the idea that you're refreshing the, refreshing the randomizer all the time. Uh, so so this, you, you're never gonna get a repeat. That's the basic idea behind it. And some people have made that argument. Um, I thought that the interesting idea, is, and this could explain why, this could explain why you're gonna forget these things because you're throwing away the neurons that actually form the representations for particular episodic memories or particular memories. Um, the DG is constantly morphing so that, um, in the future, if you have the same set of inputs, you're going to get a different output. You know, <laughs> it's just never going to be the same. Um, you sort of get a random code stamp on it every time. Right. It's sort of like a random code stamper, right? Um, the wall bob lamps. Uh, it says new evidence. I wrote this new evidence suggests that neurogenesis occurs in the cortex, um, uh, and it might be common. So, um, uh, and, and it just occurred to me, right, when I wrote that sentence, is like this there's a thing called represent representational drift where the representations of um, that are formed throughout the cortex and elsewhere change over time. And neurogenesis is an explanation why that might occur. Um, and um, anyway, similar to what we propose in the temple pooler, where neurons just pick random SDRs. Um, uh, there was another interesting thing in here, which I, I didn't explore too much, this last point. It, they, they say that the cells in CA3 seem to alternate um, between uh, two forms of activation, one being this randomization due to this dentate gyrus, and then an auto-associative completion. Um, this is exactly what we do in our temporal cooler. We have a we have a we form a, a sparse representation and then we, we learn to autocomplete it so that it recognizes itself. But there were some suggestions that the cells don't do that simultaneously. They alternate on cycles between randomization and, and auto autocompletion and randomization. I, I don't know what to make of that. Um, but there was some evidence for that. I was like, oh, that's interesting. Um, so they point you to the evidence. I, you know, this, this, there's 150 references. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just, yeah. Oh, um, but I'm just pointing out some things that I picked up saying, oh, there's a lot of interesting data about this that we cared about. I'm not sure we will really care about it. I mean, from a neuroscience point of view, it's pretty important. But from our Monty point of view, I'm not sure much of this is that important. Um, so I don't want to spend too much time on it. Here's another figure. Um, uh, this basically is illustrating some of these ideas where, it, where I was talking about how you could, on the left, they show like there's an input pattern and output pattern. They're basically arguing that two input patterns that overlap can result in an output pattern that overlap less. Well, this is not new to us, right? We do this all the time in our models, um, but they're showing how that can happen. And then the middle panel, um, you, they basically say, well, look, as the, as the input overlap, like the, the number of overlapping ones in an SDR uh, goes from zero to one, the pattern separation DD is not linear. So if there's a small amount of uh, difference, um, if there's a very little overlap, you're going to have completely different um, output representations. But if the, you have enough overlap, then it'll, it'll basically lock on to the first one. The lock on. The lock on. Is that, I don't know if that's clear. It, it's basically just showing that uh, what happens when you have pattern completion and, and overlapping spark representation. Um, at this point, I just thought I'd go to um, so the actual paper here, a couple of, couple of uh, points in the paper. Um, 
Here's the paper. Let me just zoom down. I didn't show you all the figures. It 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 wasn't. It's not worth it. Um, I did read it carefully. This is that this is that figure we're trying to argue about uh, sparsity levels in in uh, the cortex versus sparsity levels in the enteriop and the hippocampus, and they're using fMRI data, which to me is ridiculous because you know you're glum, you're glumping all glumping all these different layers of cells in in a bigger region of the cortex into one sort of sparsity index. It's like yeah, you don't have to listen. You don't play. Yes, we don't. The individual layers are going to be sparse or non-sparse, right? So it's not very useful. Whoops, what happened there? Yeah, <clears throat> how did they try and justify that? Is there supposedly some connection to like the metabolic consumption or? Uh, fMRI, if, you, if you're not, are you familiar with fMRI? Yeah, no, no, I am, but but as in like, are they arguing that they can estimate sparsity just based on the metabolic, metabolic consumption in like- Oh, a I should get, you know, I didn't spend too much time on this, Neil. Um, yeah, no, no worries, I was just curious. Uh, yeah. yeah I, I can imagine that remember. would be- Hard to I, I, compare, but but I, I don't know. You know, honestly, I just skipped over this. I didn't, you know, I didn't think it was going to be that useful. Sorry, you can read it. Um, I want to get down to a couple of quotes here. I just end with these here, and then I'm going to show you another paper. I said these results support this down in the conclusion area or someplace. These results support the view that rapid systems level consolidation, mediated by extensive synaptic changes in the near cortex. Within a short uh, time after initial, it's possible if novel information is consistent with previous acquired knowledge. They're basically saying cortex can learn quickly. That's what they're saying. And they, they gave some simple rat experiments which showed that, I think, you know, I don't know. Anyway, they, they basically saying, yeah, the nerve cortex can learn quickly too. I thought the idea that it's, if it's consistent with previous acquired knowledge to me is like saying, you know, if I already have the right reference frame, and I already have the right features, I can learn things quickly. But if it's like a totally new environment or a totally new problem, I'm not gonna be able to learn quickly. And that's humans are like that. Isn't that contrary to learning by prediction error? Uh, I mean, in, in, in some sense, that would say you learn more if it's not consistent with your predictions. Well, isn't that, isn't that what we think too? Yeah, but that says it's only if it's oh, consistent I, with- I, I, I think what they were, they were showing once a rat learned a, a new, puzzle, it was like a type of maze thing. I can show you a picture of it. Um, that it, it takes around a long time to figure out, oh, there's a puzzle here, I'm supposed to solve this thing. Right. And once they've solved that thing, then they can learn new variations of the puzzle quickly. Okay. So it might be like the rat doesn't even have a concept of what this, this puzzle is. It's no, there's not even a reference frame to represent it. So you might have to learn a new reference frame for this puzzle, and now it can just pop into pieces easily. Um, but, uh, yeah. I don't know if that, how that relates to your comment. It seems kind of difficult. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, it's it's sort of a weird. It is a weird phrase, consistent with previous. I, I know. I mean, even but something like that. I mean, if if we are faced with some novel thing and we sort of take a little couple hours to figure out what we're in, and then we can start learning it. That's all happening within a few hours. We can do that. There's no sleep involved. No replay. Well, we can like, still. You never learn how to read music, right? And I teach you how to read music. It's not going to happen right away. You're going to have to work on it for weeks to really get to be able to read music. To be good at it. Right. But if you, in the morning, you could show me a few notes and where they look, what they, where they are. And in the afternoon, I would probably be able to tell you what. Well, what right. But now I'm going to ask you to learn. I'm going to ask you to learn a new song, right? And if I if I've really internalized music reading, I can learn a new song pretty quickly. But if I'm still just, I just got exposed to musical staff this morning, I'm not going to be able to learn this song. I'm just going to be struggling. Yeah, with sight reading takes a long time. Uh, well, not just sight reading. Yeah, and I'm not talking about being an expert in it. It's just, but you can remember stuff in the afternoon that you learn in the morning. I just, if, it, if you say, how long is it going to take me to learn um, a new song? If I know how to read music, I'm going to do it really quickly. If yeah. I don't have to read music, I'm probably going to not learn it very well at all. And I won't, I'll have to go back and, I'm, I'm just giving you an example. I, they, they, you want me to show that the, they they showed the um, uh, where was it? I didn't want to go here, but it's right. No, we don't have to. It's yeah. just I just found that phrase really. Well, there was curious. a picture here. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of curious things in this paper. Well, I don't know where. Maybe it's further down. Oh, it's probably further down. Yeah, you may can go on. I still see that. Yeah. Oh, is this, this is the picture. This is like a rat is learning to associate smells of locations in an right. environment. And 
and, and the rat can't learn this quickly. Uh, but once the rat has learned how to learn here, and then they can give new smells and new locations, the rat can learn it quickly. And they, and they show that that learning is in the cortex. Uh, yeah, it's, it's that kind of simplistic stuff. Um, uh, oops, just a couple more quotes. Um, again, along the same line, we now characterize the rate of learning in the cortex as to be independent on prior knowledge rather than being slow. Um, uh, because the input the hippocampus depends on the structure knowledge in the cortex, it follows the hippocampal learning will also be dependent on prior knowledge. That doesn't mean much. <laughs> then this one, deep networks share the characteristics of slow learning neocortical system discussed previously they achieve optimal parametric characterization of the statistics of the environment by learning gradually through repeated interleave exposure to large numbers of training examples. And, and here I, I made that argument earlier. I say, well, they argue the only course is like a multi-level DNA and be able to be a back prop. And therefore you have to have all these repeated interleave training episodes uh, and it can't do continuous learning. Um, so they say the cortex can't do continuous learning. Um, they argue that's what the hippocampus does. And it continues to replace interleave past memories so the cortex can learn all the background. That's ridiculous. That means that everything that cortex knows has to be also stored in the, hippocamp in the hippocampus because that's what interleave meaning and artificial neural networks requires. Um, and then I said the alternate explanation is the cortex can learn continuously. It learns slowly because it primarily learns by synaptic genesis, which takes time. And repetition helps, but catastrophic beginning is not a problem. Um, and I, that's how I felt coming into this, and I still feel that way coming out of it. So that's all I was going to do on this paper. Uh, I had one other thing to show you. I thought was I thought might be interesting. Um, if it's okay, do I have time? Sure. Mm -hmm. um, this was one of the papers that I came across uh, while reading that one, and uh, it was interesting. So in our model. The way we model this in our neuroscience models, we have synapses and we have a thing called the uh, permanence. And the permanence represents the, between being an axon and a dendrite that have no synapse, that would be permanent zero, and then some stages in between where the synapse is growing, and then at some point it becomes effective, meaning it starts to work, which is, gives it a value of one, but it can, the permanence could increase continuously, making it more permanent. So it's, there's, a, there's a graded growth of synapses, but a binary um, efficacy, right? It's a binary synapse. And so this paper is all about that idea, slightly very, it's a variation idea, where they're, they're calling that synaptic metaplasticity. That would be our permanence. That's the term they're using that. And, um, and, and how that plays out with sparse associative memory. So there are, they go through some you know, analysis. I didn't go through the analysis, the mathematical analysis, but showing that if you have sparse networks, I mean, sparse activations, then this uh, metaplasticity really helps. It, like, it can really make your memories, your systems much more um, uh, robust in various ways. Um, but if you have dense networks, it doesn't help. Now, this wasn't done with the idea of uh, active dendrites, so it's missing that whole part of that. But I thought it was interesting anyway. Um, it was sort of, sort of tying on to stuff we did. I'll show you one picture. Uh, what do I say? What, what does metaplasticity mean versus just? Uh, I'll show you in a second. Okay. Uh, here, I'll just jump down to this figure here. Um, here's, here's, a, here's a synapse. Um, and the synapse could either have a weight zero, which is blue, or a weight one, which is red. Okay. It's a binary synapse. And, but they say that it has metastates, meta, metaplasticity. Plasticity means it's, you know, it's changing, it's, right? So they say, oh, look, it could have these four states. And in their case, our states, this would be the permanence, right? And we would say, as the permanence increases, it, it changes from blue to red. But in their case, they say there's a probability that a synapse goes from blue to red at any point in time. And the probability increases with increased training samples. So that if you're down here, um, maybe I got it backwards. Uh, there's a if you're down here, there's a one eighth one eighth chance it'll go red. Um, if you're here, it's a quarter of a chance it'll go red. And if you're here, it's a half a chance. And so, and if you're here, it's a guaranteed. So this would be like with more learning, I guess you go this direction. I don't know why they're trying to go this direction. Um, so it's a little weird because they're doing it with a probability as opposed to we just have a threshold. 
I don't know what that matters. I, I don't know what's the advantage of doing a probability. I, I didn't see them consider the idea of being a threshold. But it was interesting that they did sort of the kind of analysis that Subutai had done and others had done about what are the memory capacities of associated memories or uh, if they're sparse and that this really helps the system if they're sparse. Um, so I thought it was interesting. Um, it just, you know, other people have been, I had never really saw anyone do an analysis of networks with this idea that the, the binary synapses have changed like this. And um, so this isn't exactly the same, but it's close. I thought that was interesting. Um, when was this paper? Uh, good this was eight, that was yeah, because mm -hmm. there's been some work on binary networks in deep learning where they have this sort of meta scalar parameter that yeah. decides whether it's probabilistically connected or not. I didn't know. Well, I, I you can learn that parameter. I didn't know that. So um, I saw this as. Uh, here it says here, synaptic physiology, however, has shifted to the view on synaptic plasticity from being a continuous modification, meaning like a scale of value for synapses, or what, you know, if you look at most deep learning networks, they have a, you know, a, a, a floating point number for, for synapse, to switching between stable discrete states. We have one stable discrete, you know, but here I think they're talking about the different, like, four different levels. Or something. And then they also talk about silent synapses. Um, uh, in addition to state changes, also if you send up to get there, are also changes a little bit on the two, but blah, 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 here. Um, I, I'm not going to go into it. I read a bunch of papers on silent synapses, and um, which came out of this paper, which are basically what I, I always, I knew they existed, but I didn't know much details about them. So there's a lot of details that's known about silent synapses. These are synapses that exist, but, but don't have any efficacy. They don't have any, they're weighted zero, and that you can, Unlike this paper, well, they, I, I interpret those papers like it's more binary. It's like, yeah, obviously everything, everything gets to be um, probabilistic when you're talking about real ions and ion channels and things like that. Um, but it, it was like, yeah, with a little, with a little one little switch here, you create these new channels, basically the way they work, and you have the synapse that doesn't do anything. But with a training episode, you introduce a couple of new ion channels that can happen very rapidly. And now the synapse is working, and it's and it's effective. So like a channel moves to the membrane. It just I, I'm not if it moves or if it I forget if it moves or if it forms new ones, but it can happen very rapidly. So that's what you want because you can't grow the synapse properly, but you can turn it on and off. Anyway, so I I, I didn't want to uh, go through all this stuff, but I just, there was a lot of interesting papers here. But that I, was I, I have a response to the question you had. It's the difference between a threshold and a probability. With threshold, we had to invent a mechanism to resuscitate dead neurons. With the probability, you don't need to necessarily do that. It will still explore things to set a low rate of probability. Oh, I see. So like we have, we, 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 we have dead neurons, but we, we have a mechanism that says, hey, if a neuron's never being used, we're gonna force it to be active. And you're saying right. this, this could do that on its own. That's a good observation. Right. You, mean I, like, you mean boosting? Yeah, alternate boosting, boosting, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's an interesting idea. I'm not sure if it has any advantages one way or the other. Um, you know, I, I, another way that I've, I've looked at that, Kevin, is that all neurons, pretty much, not everyone, but almost all of them, a lot of them, have some sort of background firing rate. Which they'll, they'll just fire. They'll just spike, you know, whether they get... And, and so they, they never... I would say never. The vast majority of neurons are not are never sitting there totally silent, and so it, that's another sort of uh, stochastic, potentially stochastic thing. Saying, "Yeah, they'll just learn to fire. They'll just fire." I've always felt that there's some sort of internal threshold that builds up, which is where the boosting idea came from, um, and, and internal um, uh, voltage. But um, but instead of having the the synapses be stochastic, you could have the the or probabilistic. You just have the cells firing being probabilistic, and that would solve the same problem. That's how I viewed it, uh, but it's a, a good point. Could be done this way. Anyway, that was all interesting. So the I, reasons the modern ones, they, the binary networks, they do this kind of thing is that you can't do backprop and gradient descent through binary things, and so they introduce uh, this ooh. continuous parameter. So you can do learn, and you can do gradient descent on that continuous. Oh, parameter. I didn't catch and, that. And that's, I don't know if this that has anything to do with this, but that's why. Oh. That's how people, uh, one of the ways people learn binary networks. I think that would make sense. I didn't pick that up. I bet you it's in here. <laughs> I didn't catch that. <laughs> uh, uh, interesting. 
interesting. Uh, Otherwise, this is get really complicated to learn. Yeah. As, as you know, I don't believe, you know, backprop is have, playing a big role at all. Um, obviously, backpropagation of signals is playing a role, but the idea of backprop as it's typically um, is, 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 I don't think that's the main, we, we, don't, we, we don't think that's how it's learning. I mean, that's the thousand brain theory doesn't, says that's not what's going so, on. So, so check for the silence synapses. What was the time scale when you can turn the model off? I, I don't remember, but it's fast. No, you know, milliseconds, you know, type of thing. You know, tens of milliseconds. I don't know, something along those lines. It's yeah, one it's shot. Effectively one one shot. shot. Yeah, really, one shot. That's what you need, right? You yeah. just you walk in, you see something, and it, or you. I always like to think you have episodic memories, and not just things you experience, but your own thoughts. So if you think of something, you remember you thought of it. Like, mm -hmm. oh, I need to get a soda. I'm going to go to the, you know, I'm going to go to the to the other room. And when I get to the room, why did I come here? Oh, well, I was going to get a soda. Because I remember thinking I was going to get a soda. If you don't remember that, you get old and you don't remember that, then you go, what the hell am I doing here, right? <laughs> so, um, and, and so the science synapses, that you said there are many in the hippocampus. Well, there's a huge number of them, right? So, you know, a typical pyramidal cell in the cortex maybe have between three and 10,000 synapses, but there are, many, and there are lots of uh, pyramidal cells in the hippocampus. I don't remember which regions that have over 30,000 synapses. And, um, and, the, and and you can imagine the connectivity details are going to be different. Maybe the thresholds are different. You know, I, I, I mean, we haven't worked it through, but somehow the system has to work without growing the snaps. You have to be able to say, I'm able to, to form enough connections and get these things to fire. And, and the silent ones are both on the new context. I don't know about that. I, I don't know about that. Um, I expect, I, I once read that they find silent synapses in many parts of the brain, but there's a lot of them in here. So is it possible that there are a lot of silent synapses in, in apical dendrites in layer one? Yeah, totally. I don't know if anyone knows that. You can't tell by looking at them, right? They look like a regular synapse. So the only way- So how so, do people find out? Then. Well, you have to measure the effectiveness of it, like an action potential arrives and there's no post-synaptic depolarization. I know it's silent. Yeah, but that means you've got to be measuring the voltage on both sides, you know, on the, on the other side of the synapse and it's complicated. and. And they've worked through the, the ion channel stuff now. It looks like there's enough data on this. People know how it works. Um, but so, um, but it had to record. I just knew it had to happen because how else are you going to learn quickly, right? You somehow have to be able to do it. And that was the only thing that made sense.